right, y'all, I think we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the Poetry of Parents, Their Children, and Vice Versa panel. I have the honor of introducing our readers today. Uh, we have Philip Schaefer. Philip Schaefer's collection, Bad Summon, won the Aga Shahid Ali Poetry Prize, while individual poems have won contests published in the Puritan, Meridian, and Passages North. His work has been featured on Poem a Day, Poetry Daily, Verse Daily, and in the Poetry Society of America. He runs a modern Mexican restaurant called The Camino in Missoula. Let's give it up for Phila. Yeah. And then we also have Rob Schlegel. Uh, Rob lives in the Pacific Northwest and is the author of three previous collections of poetry, including January Machine. Uh, with the poets Rawan al khatib and Daniel Popik, he co-edits the Catenary, Catenary Press. Cool. Let's give it up for Rob. Uh, so I figured I would just open it up to y'all doing some readings, and then we can open it up to the audience for discussion and questions, if that's what y'all are feeling. So um, yeah, whoever wants to go first, come on up. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, I wasn't sure at first what to read, but after reading Rob's book, Child Care, and learning the title of this event, I thought I would read the poems I've been working on um, over the last year and a half. If you were here last year, I read the same poems, so I apologize. Uh, um, but they're the most relevant to kind of his material and what I thought might be good for conversation once we're finished. Um, uh, Natalie, 15 minutes, let me know. Uh, so these are, I'm going to read six or seven poems that are all letters to an unborn child. Um, my wife and I, for personal reasons, we've been trying and to no success so far. Um, so last summer I was kind of mowing the lawn and just considering um, what life would be like and uh, if we got pregnant and started just writing these letters to a kid who may or may not ever exist. And I thought that was a sort of fascinating entrance or energy into uh, the creative process and kind of just spiraled down for me. Um, I think that's kind of all you need to know. Letter to the Unborn. You do not yet live, and it is possible you never will. Still, I mow the lawn with your name under tongue, the letters pulsing together like a maraca of bees. I rub the magic eight ball of my gut and pretend I am a mother, but the clouds read, better luck next time. I palm the handle of my hatchet and imagine us deep in the woods by a body of water so green you could dream up anything, shaving kindling off the years, making memories we're bound to forget. I rest the god of my hand on your neck silently show you how to blow a small galaxy of wind between your fingertips, how to turn thin air into energy. Our best conversations happen on days like this, summer sun, a mirage of itself, gasoline on my wrists, wondering if you'll exist. Letter to Together Alone. You're nearly three in my mind, and I have you on my shoulders like a Greek myth on a trail by a creek in the mountains. I haven't hiked in years, and you want to cry, but even your acorn mind understands the job at hand. Your mother's in England again, and I feel responsibility like a mattress on my face. Maybe tonight I will share with you the secret of slicing open a hot dog, lining it with cheese, all the small pleasures of melt and char and mustard dripping on our knees. I'll spin a little early Merle dance with you on my feet. Together, we will make a call transcontinental, brush our teeth clockwise, and I'll dream it was all real with a miniature hand to squeeze. Letter to Tabula Rasa. The first time I smelled you felt like deleting the Weather Channel app and walking shirtless into the rain and laying down in the tall grass until I was the tall grass. 
You were a wet plum in my arms, pale purple and marigold, eyes sideways like lines of morse. Okay, fine. I cried, but just a little. Your weightless existence in a peacock feather filled with ink. I could have thrown you down the football field of that fourth floor hallway. I could have tucked you in my jacket and left, driven us to Rhode Island or Jeff City. When we tied the knot, it was two becoming one or something Jesus approved. And now we're three or two and a half or just a family of clouds in the eyes of a duck at sunset. Your mother has been sleeping all week today. That shows trust in us. Hold on to it. You will never be younger than the period on the end of this page. When you open the Jurassic language of your eyes, my world will change. You'll have a name. You'll swallow it whole. Letter to you from Freud and Pavlov. You are in love with your mother. That makes two of us. Together, we watch the violin of her body shave kernels of gold off a cob, lather them in butter, salt and pepper the whole fortune until a slow music floods our eyes. We're like dogs, sad and pining. Our silence the only language we've ever believed in. I want you to know she is younger than you ever will be. How her hair nests tropical birds, how the metronome of her breathing with you on her chest predates time. You will learn some things about her no one else will ever know. You will forgive yourself the thoughts of inflicting danger. You will tear us apart and glue us together, and I will never hesitate to look down the hallway of your mind and fill it with a promise thrown on the floor like a bag of ice. Letter to Time Unknown. I walk around town looking for interesting stones, river shrapnel, anything semi-natural I can convince you someday is supernatural. I want to take an arrowhead and carve the small watermelon of you out of your mother's belly. We're going to kill each other in the kitchen, the hospital, and it will be your fault. Know this now, I consider you a threat. But it takes two to tango, kiddo. And a dozen plus years from now, when I receive a call from Officer Horsebreath about the egged house or knife truck tires, I will swear on her life that you were by my side, at home, building a UFO from little relics found in a shoebox in the garage from time unknown. Just two more of these. Letter to Hindsight in 2020. We played the conception game like we were in the middle of a hurricane. Ate bananas for dinner, went full bonobo. We dreamt our tiny apartment was an island, tiptoed around the lava kitchen tiles, drew a waterfall out of the clawfoot. There were moments we wanted it all to end, for this to be our awakening, our silence, an opera with a machine gun in its mouth. But we wanted you, too, not knowing who you were your strawberry pigtails, the microcosmic laugh that can grab a human heart and rip it like a phone book in half. We could feel a presence better than us, finally, until it became us. Your little spit-ups, toes the size of orange Tic Tacs, a distraction into another world. Truth is we might have killed you by imagining you. Some days now we wake up hot skin, tea kettling hot skin, and the fire goes eyeball white, blank as an EKG, the idea of the moment somehow always greater than the moment the ember floats away. Um, and this last one, the title bleeds into the first line, which is actually just the first word before it ends. Letter to not never, but still born like a field mouse in a shoebox, a buried microphone. I wrote your name, which finally had a body with your mother's leftover hair along the shower wall, the first and only horror story. I guess it's Groundhog Day in October again. Doesn't matter, but I keep imagining your first peewee game, your first rabbit costume, your worst self being entirely forgivable. 
Now that you finally have a shape to miss, a dead yawn the size of a single parenthesis, half a marriage. We've been saving our issues for when you left for college or abroad. Maybe that was the kicker that didn't kick. Maybe it's my fault. I want you to know that your siblings will remember you. They will not have your name. When I dream these days, it's in television static. I slap the antenna of my brain, and every once in a while, a face appears. I can't tell if it's you or the alien of your in-between existence. If the heart is both verb and noun, you lived a real life. Only time can be forgotten. Um, how are we doing? OK. I have either a couple more poems I could read or that don't relate to this morbid stuff. Um, or I, some, I wrote a little flash piece, a little lyrical flash piece that does relate to it, um, but it's more prose-like. Any preference? Do it? OK. So this is sort of a continuation of that, but the opposite. It's a projection of what life theoretically could look like in f about five years um, with said kiddo. Um, fallen angels. It's the anniversary of the anniversary, and we're trying to keep the tradition alive. A neighbor I tolerate brings over warm ginger snaps, and I think about keeping the Tupperware. There's a small tiger in your hair, I say, and her eyes squint into question marks. I must be high but can't remember. She says something through me into the kitchen, but I rarely listen unless money or an easy job is involved. Your mother loved Neil Young, she continues, and I fight the urge to cry. Thank you for the cookies with the closed door. I grab a brown bottle with a yellow label and sit outside with the rest of them. The air smells like honey and wet garbage, a welcome chill to the way people stand and talk with their mouths as if the funeral was this morning. Dottie sits on my lap with a green water gun. Hands up! And her blood blue eyes laugh into my tomb. She looks like her mother and my mother playing cribbage together in a, in a park in a small town no one's ever heard of. She has my sharp nose, the one thing I prayed she wouldn't. Natalie grabs her from my lap, asks me to make an ice run. We've been arguing lately, mostly about the little stuff, which makes me nervous. I stop at Ace first because it's next to the grocery store and because I feel the urge to buy something heavy. I'm terrible like this. Our bank account constantly hovers above broke like a shadow, a waning EKG. I palm a mall with a rubber handle and fumble the cashier a plastic card. I forget the ice and have to turn back but feel powerful. They formed a chair circle on the patio as if church just let out. They're sharing their best memories, but it feels fixed. I feel bad for my dad. The doctor says unless something abnormal happens, he's got at least another 25 years. He'll outlive me, I think, and grab a, next, and grab a seat next to him with a couple cold ones. Natalie side-eyes me with that paragraph of a look that says it's only noon. My body feels like a cigarette. I should ask my dad to take me on a run with him, but would, it would only embarrass me. The new dog hovers by the corner of the fence over the old dog. They sniff each other from either side of the world. I fight the urge. I pull the turquoise tarp off the cord of red oak to justify my pride. Natalie spatulas the burger patties with an Aperol spritz in her other hand. She looks like a fallen angel. I married those shoulder blades, and I'll be buried in them. Sweat pencil lines down my nose as I go to town. It's a peppermint 66 degrees out, and the second beer is talking to the first beer. Square your feet, center your mind, drop the guillotine. My shoulders are earthquakes. The dog shadows my noise like a metal detector. Our daughter wants a go. I picture her in 10 years knocking out some guy who wants to feel her up. She will be strong like her mother. I pick her up and fly her around the yard. Balance, grip, thirst, back muscle. My body feels like a song. Once there's ketchup on everything, I build the fire we don't need to feel less useless all the time, to smell the work of my purchase. 
The wood is dry and catches quickly, a handicap I'm grateful for. I let it rage, inserting my face with each ladder lick of flame. Natalie, and probably everyone else, looks confused but complimentary. A pup being petted after pissing on the carpet, my sanctuary. Before everyone leaves, my father says something only a retired minister can say. It's the poem he's lived that I'm stuck writing. It makes my brothers and I want to be better friends, but how much more time can go by? He looks like a statue of himself, something fashioned by God for God. His words have never been fancy. He scans the room, so to speak, then closes his eyes. The only prayers I've ever meant are the ones he leads. She can't hear you, I think, but she does. Thank you. Um, thanks, Julian, too, for hosting. I might stand up. That's okay. Might be easier for me. The sentence. In the gospel according to children, love is a sentence containing a logic no syntax can trace. Mom throwing parties just to ruin them. Dad blaming everyone but himself. You remember it, don't you? Riding your bike past the city's edge into marshlands you thought were protected. Deep in the grass, a box labeled plot. From that point on, did you want them to acknowledge you? Or leave you alone with your paper boats inspired by birds so tired of performing? Wind buffets the mylar balloon trapped in the neighbor's red maple. Am I closer to the sentence than I am to Keisha? My daughter asks why elk pee on themselves. They found a logic, I say. Like Nero, my son says, to light his parties, he burned his own people as lanterns. My daughter dreamed I used the vacuum hose to suck the sentence from my eye. In my notebook, I write, the female figure my father sculpted props up a succulent, too large for its pot. Daddy, my daughter says, when are you going to stop? She's building a spaceship large enough to carry her and her toy horse to a planet immune to the sentence. My son warns of nebula. What's that, she says. From Earth, it looks like a bright patch in the night sky. But what's it look like from space? My son turns away. My daughter closes the hatch over the horse's head. Stay safe, she says. Take a sentence of a dozen words. Take 12 men and tell to each one word. Stand the men in a row. Let each think of their word as intently as they will. Nowhere will there be a consciousness of the whole sentence. My daughter and I eat lunch at the kitchen table. My son reads in his room. Keisha's on campus. The semester has just ended. Not even the radio is playing. How do you hold mom's hand? My daughter asks. Like this? Our fingers interlace. Or like this? Poetry. 
is pointless, my son says. If you write that down, I'll kill you. I fear he fears the attention I give it. I used to drive till he fell asleep 10 minutes, then silence the river knit with ice. In tonight's movie, a boat swerves against bullets. He sings the movie's theme. I kill you, you kill me. Plot against all that is good. Good for whom? I know every word that rhymes with my assailant's first name. It's difficult to achieve real world fear in a movie. My son crawls into bed. There's nothing I need more than you, I say. Not true, he says. The rudder turns in my throat. Every sleep, he needs me less. So I'm just going to read maybe um, three or four more poems from here, and then maybe a new one that has less to do with children. Subjective units of distress. One. My son loads a toothbrush with ozone. Tell me what you feel, I say. I feel like you're a jerk. No, I say, tell me what you feel. I feel like you're worthless and I hate you. Two. My father calls. His father is in the ICU. I don't know what to say. Well, my father says, I wrote it till the garden today. Three. Between teaching and parenting, I somehow find time to notify my therapist of a change to my insurance. Four. What's your mom's, 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 mom's name? Five, a man at the ATM is trying to deposit his hand. Where he is, is earth. He's my father, my dad, the day before the day of my birth. Six, in the CVS, neon touches my son and I, pretending to be strangers. Seven, my mother opens the oven with an oven mitt. Julie gave me this, she says. How is she, I say. Dead, she says. I told you that. Eight. Keisha is awake. She thought she heard me groaning in my sleep, as if I suffered a violent blow to my chest. Nine. My mother would turn on the faucet, wet a bar of soap. Her left hand held open my mouth. 10. When will I reach the people I love? I sit where the shade would be if there were trees. Did that door just close on its own? Oh. Yeah, that would have been nice. Uh. Inheritance. Why can't I love the painting my sister loves? It's true the painter was an ass, and yet, there's nothing as mysterious as a fact clearly described is something he said. Does everyone feel cramped? On the subway, people are beautiful and dead. Even the birds share space. I saw where Dan and Callie sleep. Are they happy? 
I mean the birds. In the Met video installation, Death is Elsewhere, two siblings sing in a meadow surrounded by remnants of volcanic eruptions that triggered a famine that killed 25% of the Icelandic population. I focus on the siblings to avoid eye contact. It's like the subway between tragedies, everyone perfecting their own style of aversion. Thomas Edison proposed to equip the Statue of Liberty with a voice that could be heard at the northernmost tip of the city. In the cafe, the barista says, Satan's bomb with almond milk for Sydney. Someone's ringtone announces, that idiot is trying to reach you on your cell phone device. I search my phone for long-term health effects of feeling anonymous. A man adjusts his face to fit the camera's frame. Friends in his feed eat the flowers off his shirt. Is a person alone a portrait? I count the bones in Gerard David's The Deposition, the Gilded Age impinging. Callie asks if pursuing the exotic is inherently masculine. We're caught off guard by a masked man in a red leotard. It's Ed, he says. When we don't understand, he removes the mask. Ed, from Seaview? He shows us a picture of his girlfriend in bed. Hundreds of twenties fanned out in both hands. And that, Ed says, is eight grand, her inheritance. We had sex on that money. Dan says, we all have inner lives, but not everyone is granted access. Callie disagrees, citing directive. My sister says, we're in a poem she read. I stare at the painting of a galloping horse, the rider tragic. Is he waving to the orchardist come to prune the good tasting apple tree? Or me, that I might set him free? Years ago, on my lunch break at Jimmy John's, I realized the man to whom I tried selling a book would purchase the book on Amazon. I push the rider off his horse. The horse is free. Rider, where shall I bury thee? The rolling hills of Pomeroy bring the locals local joy. What do you do when your friends leave and you're alone with every object in the room? Mom texts a picture of my daughter's stuffed owl. Should this live here? What's worse, uniformed children or betraying friends and family by writing about them? Mom says she's only as happy as her unhappiest child, my sister, my sister and I. No one's interested in workshopping the painting. I make another sentence, overspell orchid. Are all my relationships predicated on man's obsessive naming? The painting is called Inheritance. Um, I'll read one more poem, maybe, unless you stop me midway, because it's kind of a long one. Um, this spring I went to um, the James Merrill House for a writing residency, and I started a poem there that had nothing to do with children, and um, it ended up becoming a crown of sonnets, but not full sonnets. There are only 12 line sonnets. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that kind of fast. Um, I've, I haven't shared this with anyone but one friend. Um, so I'm reading it now kind of for the first time. I think it's done. So that's good. Um, it's called Another Green World. And 
Um, it's after a painting by Nicole Eisenman, who um, made this, she makes remarkable paintings, but this one painting features a party scene. There are like maybe 20 or 25 figures in it. And I saw it for the first time during the pandemic. And I think it was so thrilling to see so many human bodies in such like close proximity, even though it was two dimensional. Um, it made me feel multi-dimensional when I saw it. So this is called Another Green World. You are not your thoughts. You are not the painter's palette and brush, nor the poet swimming in the sea. They've no memory of entering. You are not a repository. You are not your playlist, your green caffeine, carbon footprint offset. You are not the white pawn, nor the trout feeding on mayflies at dawn. You are not your prescription, not the decrepit barn. You are not your age, the awkwardness silence makes. You are not the silence of the painter you stand before in judgment. You are not your history, your send button. You are not your demon cat, fine milled putter, mediocre spice rack. You are not the compliments your boots elicit, not your impatience with dominant forms of narrative. You are not your preferred customer status, Seabald's seahorse and pelican, his soaring prose. You are your cargo shorts. Stop explaining jokes. You are not your pistachio joke, nor the rabbit nibbling clover. You are not the only way out is the sentence. You are not your leonine eyes, your combustible hair. You are not your generation's self-flattering notions of imminent collapse nor history's ultimate protagonist. You are not your syllabus, your flag attracting wayward teens. You are not the wind, nor your meditation. You are not your neighbor's blossoming quince. You are not your talent blossoming. And you are not your ambition, your zip code, screenplay, zip ties holding together your vintage Volvo. You are not your mother's favorite, not her evolving opinions on definitions of sentience. You are not your whimsical facts about birds. And you are not your Roman nose, your fatigue, your wedding fugue. You are not your beloved reminding you, you are not your failed interview. In your loneliness, you are not your failure to finish the essential Nietzsche. You are not Bristol, the brave young horse running in snow, blowing white and blue shadows. You are not your operatic visions of friendship and addiction nor the poorly titled paintings of Francis Bacon. You are not your hot jeans, bushel of warm peaches. In your no-sex summer, you are not your Splenda. Michael Stipe, you are not. Not Tracy Chapman, not the letters you sent them. You are not yourself an open letter nor your desire for handsome John Ashbery helping you score the musical, the winds aren't real and so are we. You are not making enough money. The cut, the bus, are you coming? You are not your contacts, not your ambivalence before the mirror in which to be reflected is to be seen in proportion to everything you are not your practice smile. Are you alive enough? Are you loved? Am I human enough to know I am not merely 
twice around the block, once on my phone, once not. On the beach, you are not the jewel in the bucket filled with your father's teeth. You are not your atoms, nor the atoms randomly organized into the ancient bristlecone pine. In the sun, you are not your sister's butterfly. You are not alone when you breathe, your thoughts do as they please. You are not your mother's widow moon. And you are not Henri's moon-colored house, nor the trip to Mystic for provisions, lettuce, soap, broom. You are not the red peppers scanned at checkout, nor the car tailgating all the way home. You are not the bags you carry into the house where you recognize the painting framed on the mantle. You are not the bouquet Henri assembles from lilacs growing opposite the pear the neighbor insists bears no fruit. You are not the fruit in the painting critics praised in magazines famous for introducing talent to markets defined by morally ambiguous men signaling virtues the most righteous among them fail to reach despite their significant resources. You are not your land acknowledgement and you are not your angry poem, your trespass over the electrified fences of the rich who wish to privatize every beach, fen, pond, and forest. In your apartment at the pines, you are not comparing humans to bees thou shalt not trap between glass and screen. You are not insect patience as you finish your drink before using your pen at noon to seek a logic, evening wine degrades. You are not your fait divers, your offering to the novelist's ghost, insisting the painter's subject is equal to the poet's vision. If you are the poet in the crown featuring lines from Bernadette, you are not the two crows, one waiting for the other. In the painting, you are not Rachel lifting her drink to Anna's lips, nor Stephen flipping the vinyl. You are not on the veranda laughing at Chad, passed out beneath coats on the bed, while in her lap, Jess cradles M's head as Asher sparks a lighter for L in a scene so realistic, does it render the real irrelevant? You are not your increasingly erratic behavior, friends and family attribute to severe storms in whose aftermath you're less likely to translate Ruskin from the dream you're not remembering than you are to mother another sonnet. You are not at least poems end, and you are not the poet when you ask, what can I feel that hasn't been sold? And you are not the questions disappearing in verse, nor the briny detritus on the hull of a boat, the underbelly of a nation whose illness reveals the systems that torment it. You are not the music on your phone interrupted by a call. You are not your dog escaped, disappeared into a thicket. How long till she returns with a rabbit? You are not the painter in the kitchen preparing fluke and asparagus, nor the poet asking questions about process. You are not your limbs after dinner growing heavy. Not my Lysistrata, my unannounced rhyme. Are you surprised by the circumstances you tolerate? You are not the egret hunting, nor the plover dancing for sex on a path littered with stones, remnants of walls erected over centuries of lies. You are not the rabbit decapitated. You are the rhyme. Go ahead, take another photo of the sunset. Thanks for sitting through that and listening. Do you want to come up, Phil? Are we going to sit together? OK. I guess my, my first question is kind of about, you both talk about like, these reflections on sort of your own experiences in your childhood and your relationship with your parents, and how that kind of leads into um, how you 
Um, so I hear you both talk about kind of re reflections on your own childhood and like relationship with your parents and how that kind of bleeds into um, how you are a parent today or how you would be a parent. And so I'm kind of just curious about that concept and like what it's like to write about that and what it's like to reflect on those relationships and kind of bring that into your present. Does that make sense? Okay. Hello. Okay. Um, I feel like I was blessed with remarkable parents um, until I was a parent. Um, and then it got more complicated um, because I started to notice some of the insecurities and neuroses that my parents had were coming through in my parenting with my kids and that was something that didn't exist for me before they were just my parents were just like I always thought they were the best and I still think they're the best but now they're more complicated because I have kids and I know uh, how that transfers um. I I think for me, I'm just more at that in-between age of realizing I'm an adult. Um, you know, the, the mid -cri midlife crisis age, in a sense. And uh, my parents also, I have a great relationship with them. They're fantastic people. But um, I can see them aging as metaphorically as I can physically. And so to kind of grapple with the hypothetical world of being a parent myself, it really just creates more gravity towards our mortality for me, at least in my writing and thinking about it. Um, Rob, you had this line in one of your poems. It's not one that you, you read tonight or today, but um, it really struck me. It was, I have no place to put everything my children make me feel. Um, and I was thinking about that and this like concept of sort of memorializing these moments um, in poems and poems kind of being like a form of like, I don't know, like a time capsule or like a scrapbook. Um, and I mean, this could, this isn't just for like your interactions with your children, but just poetry across the board and this, um, this idea of like capturing each moment. Um, so I'm just curious about your process with that. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I think you answered the question <laughs> in your question, which is that the, and I maybe have thought about this before the second, but right now your question clarified it, that the, the place where I put my feelings for my children are in these poems. Um, and I think that's the only possible place uh, for all of those feelings. Um, at, for a long time, I was really hesitant to enter um, my creative space with anything having to do with being a parent or like any kind of domestic uh, data. So um, I resisted that for about a, for one whole book. Um, and then um, I told someone who I admired, a, sort of a mentor, a, an adjacent mentor, and, one, and they said to me, why, why on earth would you resist that subject? And all that all it took was that question and and maybe that person's sort of approval in a in a weird way that you should probably write about that if it's something that you're resisting writing about um so i think that's that's how i started writing um about them about that domestic life and then um the process included just having a notebook handy 
around the house, especially during the pandemic, there was a lot of material coming in. Um, and, and most of what I, I wrote in the book came directly from their mouths. And um, some of it was maybe reconfigured in, into different time, into different like temporal ranges, but otherwise it was pretty word for word. If and when you felt like a grown-up as a poet, when was that? And when did you feel a poet after probably prior to that feeling like a kid? When did when did poet feel like what you were? And when did mature poet feel like what you were? Yeah. <laughs> you should go. Um, I I remember I never got into any sort of creative writing until about my junior year of undergrad, and when I was introduced to contemporary poetry, it sort of just the scales came off, and um, I revered poets so much and therefore have always had in the back of my mind like you're not one of those um, and well most of them are broke so why would you be one of those <laughs> um, but I think if it's a question of validation uh, you could just look at like little landmarks like getting into grad school or publishing a book or getting a teaching gig things like that but I don't think that's the sort of identity that makes for poets um, so I, I think I'm still searching for it <laughs> um, but I never had any sort of moment of aha um, whether as a, a kid or later on it was more so just like holy shit someone's gonna publish this book or someone's asking you to read just like I'm gonna say yes for sure but like are you sure <laughs> I think I think that um, with every poem that I write, I feel more like a kid. Like I'm getting further away, which is much to like Keisha's chagrin. I feel more childlike after writing more and more because it requires that. It requires a kind of to me that like uh, it's not complete. It's not being completely naive, but it's it's stepping into not knowing in the way that a kid doesn't know about a lot of the world, and um, so it's it's a difficult place to be. But sometimes, because you want to be, you want to feel like you've learned how creativity works and your process works. But um, I feel like that can be dangerous to to feel too comfortable in that knowledge of your own process. Any kind of writer that can express vulnerability is obviously one that we're going to be able to relate to more. And I wonder particularly as you've written about this really personal situation of wanting to be a parent, has that enhanced your ability to be vulnerable? Is that a big step, or is that just something that you've always been able to do? Great question. Um, I, I think the answer is yes. I, I think for me, uh, kind of speaking toward what Rob's been saying, is like if, if you feel this resistance toward it, then lean into it. I think that's just a really good rule to live by in the arts in general. Um, and when I've written up until like this sort of project, I've always tried to um, ride or toe the line between risking sentimentality and being too obtuse. And uh, I think you know deep down when you've put something on the page that sort of makes you afraid. And you're like, can I show this to my wife? Can I show this to uh, my father, my best friend, my best poetry reader? And if, if you click send, and it 
it makes your heart race a little bit. Like you've done something, even if the, the poem itself sucks, you've done something. Um, and, and I think for me, it's really just leaning into it without letting the, the emotions do all of the legwork. You have to have some sort of structure and ability to kind of move the language. Um, but if you can communicate something that is specific to you and yet universal to others who have been through such a thing, then hopefully you're creating a you know, connection there. Are you, I, I, is your question about my poetry or my person? <laughs> about the pouring the one into the other. Yeah. As, as you do that, and obviously it's line after line, what do you discover as, do you discover anything as you go pushing each of those lines where you are not the sun? Yeah. Yeah, what I discovered is, I mean, what I've discovered for now, this will probably change if it's a good poem, is that I actually, I mean, I think I actually, am, I am all those things. Like, that's that's exactly what I am. But, and, and so trying to resist, um, being either too attached to those things or having those things def having those things point toward what I, I think I am or who I think I am. Um, the, the tension between that, for me, uh, is generative. And um, so, yeah, I, I've gone back and forth between thinking about getting rid of the knots in all those lines and just saying you are this you are this you are this um and then that accumulation might start to overwhelm to the point where it's like a reader or myself might feel like resisting that and saying no i'm i'm none of that but what am so if i'm none of that which is everything then what am i so that might be a good revision, actually. <laughs> Maybe I should just change, get rid of the knots, and then by the end of the poem, a reader might feel like, I don't want to be all those things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that poem and go figure, out, figure it out on my own, maybe. I don't know. That's a nice thought, but I don't, don't think do you that. can change them. <laughs> it, rhetorically and as a listener, it, yeah. it's dialed. Just as an example, um, I published a piece a little while ago called Who is Responsible for the Suffering of Your Mother? And I was really going back and forth on whether or not I was going to tell my mom that I published it and like, send it to her and let her know about it. Um, so I'm just curious with, with both of you kind of writing about um, your relationship with your parents and around your relationship with your children and having these quotes and having these very like, vulnerable and poignant reflections on, on those relationships. Like, what is that like to then, like, do you share those with your parents? Do you share those with your children? Or is that something you have to be completely 
compartmentalize it away from them. Just curious. Um. <laughs> I shared the book with my parents. Um, and when I gave it to them in like a, a Word document, I said what my son said to me about his role in the book, which was, it's me and not me. So I said to my parents, these, these parents are you and they're not you. And that's it. That's all I, that's all I needed to say, <laughs> which is kind of a cop out, but um, it, made it, it made it for me easier to send to them. And it's, it's true. It is them and it isn't them. Um, so that's how I handled that. Um, as a parent, if, if one of my children made something that somehow was emerged out of our relationship, I would, I think, I think I'd want to see it no matter what it was. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Would you, did you end up sending it? I did. I sent it and she was like, wow, this is super accurate. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it went well. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I have not sent, I, I don't think I've sent any of that to my parents, um, but especially the, the flash piece, because it's the idea of my mother not being here still. And I think, you know, maybe it would be too hard on her, but I think it would be harder on me knowing I sent it. Um, so we're going to wait on that one. Um, and when, when my book came out, this was six years ago, uh, I remember my mom calling me after she read it and asking if I was okay. <laughs> the poems had nothing to do with my folks, but they're just, you know, a little bit darker than what they're used to. And I was like, Mom, it's still me. Like, I'm happy, things are good, but my writing life is a different, you know, attic of thought. <laughs> Thank you.